It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. We are delighted that you're joining us. It's a little brief respite from your football watching. Yes, the Super Bowl is ready, teed up. You got a whole week to prepare for it. And while you are making your chili or whatever else you're going to make for your Super Bowl party, we'll be with you. You know, maybe you're going to get some stuff done this weekend, freeze it for next weekend. Mark, you'd be so proud of me. You know what I made? A slow-cooked pork shoulder. Oh, man, that was good. But you got to be around. Do you have a slow cooker, Mark? How's this? Should I get a slow cooker? All right. He says they come in handy. I'll get, uh, I'm just starting my, I'm really starting to get more into cooking. Mark is trying to guide me. So I guide him about financial matters, but not even so much anymore, Mark, now that you're a certified financial planner professional. Exactly. He's like, Jill who? Maybe this means that you should get on the air with me and stop lollygagging around behind that glass. Yeah, whatever. Okay. Uh, This is a program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. And we are broadcasting live from the Capital One studios. Capital One, what's in your wallet? Oh, I should also mention that this weekend um, we are, it's Chinese New Year. And it is the year of the rat. Mark's son was born year of the pig, which is why we like to call him little piggy sometimes. Not because he's a piggy, because he's actually pretty, he's pretty skinny, I think like his parents. Anyway, do you have a financial question? I'd love to hear from you. It would be so lovely. All you have to do, send us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Askjill at jillonmoney.com. How's the email inbox looking, Mark, as we enter in the second, enter to the second month of the year? We we catching up? All right. He thinks we're going to be caught up in a couple of weeks. The thing is that every time I take a little bit of a break, we will blow it. And then all of a sudden, you know, that will get us behind. But we try in earnest. So don't look. If you don't get a response immediately, maybe, maybe we are just trying to figure out what else we have to do. But we'll get to you. I promise. OK. All right. Now, Kathy is calling from California. Is that right? Hello, Kathy. Welcome to the program. What can I do for you? Hello, Jill. Hi. Well, thanks so much for taking my call. Um, I'm calling because I wanted to get um, just another opinion. I know you're kind of a straight shooter, so I appreciate that about you. Um, I'm calling because my uh, my fee-only advisor, who I've been working with for a couple of years, and I really trust her, um, she's um, advising me to add a non-traded REIT hmm. to my portfolio um, for kind of a non-correlated asset and just need to, to diversify further. Hmm. And I'm not sure that that's a good idea because all the research I'm doing, people seem to say that's a little bit of a risky um, idea. Well, tell us a little bit about you and then let's figure out whether, I mean, look, just because it's not traded doesn't make it bad. It means it's usually illiquid. So that could mean that it's tough to get your money up, but maybe there's a reason to do it. So tell us a little bit, a bit about you. Tell, how old are you? Okay, so I'm 50 years old, Mm -hmm. and I am semi-retired. I teach some college classes uh, part-time, and I have um, about $2.8 million in uh, just regular brokerage account, um, and I have about $50,000 in a regular IRA, and I have $381,000 in a bond ladder fund, and I have a pretty good emergency fund as well. I do have currently, out of that, um, the portfolio that I told you, that's the um, the brokerage account, mm-hmm. about 5% of that is real estate. Oh, already. And it's just two different, two different Vanguard um, REIT index funds. Hmm. So, okay. how You said you're teaching uh, part-time. How much do yeah. you draw down on the portfolio right now? Uh, not very much because it's just me by myself. So I'm only, it may be about, Four thousand a month. Hmm. So that's pretty. And do you think you'll keep doing the some of the part time gig work? Is there any reason why you think you might be kicking up the withdrawal amounts um, anytime soon? 
No, I've got two kids in college, but that's already taken care of with 529. So, no, I I don't think so. And I'll probably Hmm. keep up the part-time work as well. Well, I mean, it's interesting because, you, as you said, you already have a 5% real estate position. So um, is there any kind of conversation that she had, the advisor had with you about, well, I think this will be good. It will drive income. Like, what was the rationale behind this recommendation? Well, definitely she was saying, you know, it is income producing. And she was just saying it was always good to have some non-correlated assets. I I think it's just something that she maybe herself really likes and thinks it's a good idea. But I always, I'm kind of a researcher and I want to make sure before I put money into something, I want to make sure it's a good idea and that, um, that it's, you know, appropriate for me. And again, I do trust her. Yeah. I mean, I guess that, okay, big picture, you trust her. She's, she's fee only. So she's not getting a commission by selling you this particular investment, right? Right. Okay. So the motivation, let's, let's just presume good motivation. Like, Hey, I just, I found this great asset. I think you'd like it. You know, you don't need to grab a ton of your money all at once. And and I presume she's asking, uh, uh, she's suggesting you put maybe a small percentage of your total. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, I almost like, who cares if it's a great investment? It sort of feels like, eh, What's the point? You, you're, right. Your portfolio is doing just fine. You got plenty of money. Things seem to be rocking and rolling. And you've got, um, I presume in that brokerage account, stocks, bonds, cash, REITs. You've got the bond ladder itself. Y- you've got a yeah. healthy emergency reserve fund. So it may be a decent investment. On the other hand, I sort of say like, so what? Who cares? Like, I don't, right. if, if I'm at the point where I have all the money I need, which it sounds like you are, Maybe my my view might be I don't want something that's going to be more confusing. Actually, I learned this from a client a million years ago when I was in the client business. I was suggesting that there was this I same same thing happened to me. Like I ran across the thing like this is so cool. It's a private placement. It would be really great. And she looked at me and she goes, eh, eh I got to wait for the tax filing. I don't want to wait for an S1. And I always thought in the moment, like, actually, she's right. I made that that right. she has good that made a good sense to me. Like there's no huge imperative for you to be doing anything different. Sounds like things are good. So I think I might say to her, hey, you know what? Thanks so much. I totally love that you brought something new to me. I really want to keep it simple. Things are going great right now. Let's keep as is. And then move on yeah. from there. And don't let it get in the way, especially if you really like her. Right, right. I love that. I love the idea of keeping it simple because there's no reason for me to make this more complicated. That's right. And and if you if there is no reason, then let us not make a reason. And it sounds like you're in fantastic shape. You're doing a great job managing your money. And I think that in many ways, I, I look at these situations where, um, you know, look, an advisor can be earnest and, and smart and forward thinking. But after doing it for many years and now being some time, having some distance, I think there were times that I, too, would say, like, oh, what? they don't get it. It's such a great – like, who cares? It could be a great investment. It just doesn't matter. So, Kathy, keep it simple, stupid. It's the KISS method. So I'm blowing you a kiss here from the East Coast. Thanks so much for calling. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. All you have to do is send us a note. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Hey, during the break, why don't you go into the website, JillOnMoney.com. You can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. Do it right now. Okay, we'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Uh, You know what snuck up on you, perhaps, while you've been basically doing the things you do in your real life? Mortgage rates dropped pretty significantly over the past year, almost a full percentage point lower Are you thinking about a refi? So many different kinds of people might be interested in this. Don't just do what Mark does, which is, oh, it's a pain in the neck. I'm not going to save that much money. You may want to actually run the numbers. You know, the costs of these uh, refis, it is expensive, but because there's more and more competition, I think that you might find that the costs have gone down. It is a pain in the neck. Let me be 100% clear. It's a pain in the neck. And yes, 
you know, paying two, three, four, f- even five percent of a loan can be expensive. But if you're staying in your place for the long term, it may behoove you to go through the pain in the neck. It may behoove you to at least run the numbers. There's all sorts of calculators out there. I think I had a good one. I think HSH was one. HSH.com had a good refi calculator that I ran across. You can check that out. But, you know, maybe you're paying uh, private mortgage insurance. Maybe you've got an adjustable rate mortgage. Maybe it's uh, time for you to pay down some outstanding debt. By the way, don't forget that debt. When you pay down debt that's not associated with your home, the interest associated on that portion of the debt, not deductible. But check it out. I put something up on the website. Should you refinance, you can check out the article at jillonmoney.com. Okay, let us get back to the calls. It is Lily who is on the line. Lily, where are you calling from? I heard a rumor that you were perhaps somewhere near, let's say, the MK, Magic Kingdom. Is that true? (laughs) Yes, I am. I'm very close to it. Oh, my My gosh. Oh, congratulations. You've you've, you've actually evolved. (laughs) You don't live there anymore? No, I do not. The congestion is horrible. So oh my I God. do not live anywhere near Orlando anymore. <laughs> I'm from um, Richmond, Virginia now. Oh, very nice. So what uh, yeah. what can I do for you today, madam? I would love some help on um I don't know if it's a possibility for me, um, but I want to check it out. I have um I'm an I high income earner. And I was wondering if I could do a backdoor Roth for mm-hmm. extra money that I have left over every month. Okay. Um, but I do have an IRA. Oh, uh, an from existing. From rollover. Yeah. Okay, wait a minute. From previously. Wait a second. So let's just go through some stuff. How, how, much, sure. how much do you earn? Um, I earn, let's say, about 200 Okay. Thousand. And are you single or married? I am married. Okay. What does partner earn? Partner earns about fifty. Okay, so you're at two fifty, um, and you're working currently. Are you self-employed or are you working for someone else? I am working for someone else. Do you have a retirement account with that employer? Actually, yes, I have two retirement accounts with them. Um, I have a four hundred three mm-hmm. and a four fifty seven. Okay, and a four fifty seven. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. So a municipality or a teacher or something like that that you are? Yeah, hospital. Okay. Hospital, got it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the old retirement plans that we talked to, that you mentioned, uh, mm-hmm. how much is in the IRA that hold that rollover IRA that holds those retire those yes. old retirement accounts? Um, about eighty thousand. Were if you look back, they're they're from previous mm-hmm. employers. Were those from four hundred three Bs or four fifty seven plans as well? Believe they were four hundred three. Okay, now there could be something very exciting that you could do. Okay. Oh, thank yes. You. That's why I called you. I know. <laughs> so, um, I think when I've run across this in the past, one way mm-hmm. to get around. So what you're so for everyone listening, Lily very wisely is saying like, hey. I don't know if I can do a backdoor Roth because even if it sounded like the greatest idea in the world where I'd put six grand away and then immediately go from a non-deductible IRA into a Roth IRA, there is a rule that's called the pro rata rule, which means if you have another IRA account, that can mess up the whole calculation and it it Mm -hmm. sort of deters people from doing it. But Lily, Mm -hmm. what if we rolled over the 80 grand of the old IRA from the old retirement accounts into the 403B that you currently have. Ah, okay. Okay. So I would have to look into that. Yeah. So what we, what you would do, I I have to say we, because all of a sudden Mm -hmm. it became my money. So what Uh we would do is you would go to your current 403B provider, whoever that is, maybe it's Fidelity or TIA Craft, whatever. You go to that Mm -hmm. provider and you say, I've got an old rollover account. I want to move 80 grand from my old account into mm. my current 403B. Now, okay. two huge advantages. One is that now your money is consolidated. That's good. Yes. I like that. Yes. Number mm-hmm. two, you no longer have the pro rata rule that you're worried about. Yes. And now, that so was that's, the big. Right? So, that was the big one. <laughs> yeah. So that wipes that uh-huh. away. Uh, okay. Who, who is the 403B provider right now? 
Um, 403 and 457, I'm really lucky, actually, so I can maximize both accounts every year, um, is with TIAA. Fantastic. I mean, first of all, you know, the the one reason, if you had said to me, the one caveat I was going to say, if it's with some crappy company, then maybe you wouldn't want to do it. <clears throat> TIAA, uh-huh. CREF, fantastic company, fantastic yeah. choices, low cost. Um, and so that, to me could be an ideal way for you to start to do the backdoor Roth. Now, I mean, I also want to be clear that, you know, you are in an interesting tax bracket that, you know, you're in this big, wide tax bracket Mm -hmm. called the 20, well, highest rather, uh, Mm -hmm. 24%. So, you know, I think that the idea of putting money away at 24%, given that you make a quarter of a million bucks a year together is a great Mm -hmm. idea. So I'm not saying you shouldn't do your 403B or your 457. You're socking away a lot of money. Do you guys have kids? We do not. Oh, that's why you have all that money. We have money. a dog. We have a furry. What furry kind of child. what kind of furry child do you have? I too have furry children, and I am okay. a hugely partial towards the furry children. So, what yes, kind of dog? Yes, we have a um, Siberian Husky. Whoa, that's yeah. a real dog. Okay, that. Yeah. You, so, I'm not messing with you. You are for okay. real. You 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 now win. You win. Okay. Oh really? Do yeah. I? <laughs> you you win. Um, I have two smaller okay. dogs, but I think mm-hmm. that you are in great shape. Um, and I think that if you cannot actually combine these, but I bet you can, because again, the, okay. sometimes they'll mess you up because they'll say, "Oh, the source of the funds is different. It comes from one. It comes from a four hundred one k, and now we're going to a four hundred three b." But if it's four hundred three b to four hundred three b, you should be able to do this. It's totally legit. You're not doing anything shady, and so okay. and and TIAA will help you facilitate this whole process. And then you can do the backdoor Roth. But let's go step by step. If you can't do it, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. alternative would be for you to start converting some of the Roth. So you wouldn't do the back backdoor Roth, but you would no. slowly start to convert the existing okay. IRA rollover into a Roth. Mm-hmm. And you just do a little okay. bit at a time to keep you in okay. your tax bracket. Got it. Good? Okay, perfect. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. And then, Jill, can you help me out with one other um issue. Yes, absolutely. Okay. But one thing yeah. that said, yeah. uh, I have to go to a break. So if you oh, um, will okay. wait for one second, we'll come back and then we'll do your next issue. How's that sound? I know it sounds great. All right. <laughs> it's Jill on money. And uh, you can see that some of these issues, they seem quite thorny at first blush. But when we review and we break things down, there uh, often are really good solutions. So if you think, oh, gosh, I can't do a backdoor Roth because of this old money, there are always some other things out there. There are some opportunities. And uh, hopefully when we come back, I won't get stumped by Lily because then she'll send her Siberian Husky after me, which would be very bad. All right. You're listening to Jill on Money. Hey, have you ever heard of a podcast? I bet you have. On We've Got a Podcast. It's called Jill on Money, just like this radio show is called Jill on Money. You can subscribe to our podcast, Jill on Money, on Apple, Stitcher, Radio.com, Google Play, anywhere you find your favorite podcast. Go check it out. Jill on Money, the podcast. All right. When we return, Lily's second question. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, a money question, maybe it's a career question, you're weighing two different jobs, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Or if you're on the website, if you're on jillonmoney.com, the website, where we have fantastic resources, and we have great bunch of articles that I've written and different appearances on TV. If you're on that website, click on the upper right corner and you will see contact. 
and you can send us an email there. Okay, before we went to the break, we were talking to Lily, and it looked like we had hopefully resolved some of the question around how to be able to do a backdoor Roth, whether it's rolling existing re- rollover money into a current plan or maybe slowly converting a IRA balance into a Roth. Um, Lily, you said you've got another question. So tell me what's up. Okay. So my husband is self-employed. He has a very small business um, currently with one employee. And so I was wondering for him, um, what would be the best way of setting aside retirement money? Mm. So he has is that it's a real employee. In other words, it's not just that he has a 1099 person who's a contractor, right? A real employee, um, but no health benefits and um, Hmm. basically hourly. Huh. Okay. Well, there are different retirement plans for self-employed people. Um, There is something called a SEP IRA. There is something Mm -hmm. called a simple IRA. And Mm -hmm. it kind of depends how much money he's going to put away for himself, which one is better. It may be there has to be some contribution for this employee. And maybe your husband would like to be able to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I think that you should look at both of them. I think the simple is obviously the simplest, <laughs> um, and, but he won't be able to put quite as much money away. That said, okay. maybe it doesn't matter because you're putting away so much money in your retirement mm-hmm. accounts. So mm-hmm. I might, if I were you, check out the simple. Um, you can do it at a major brokerage house. So it's a very, it's turnkey. The costs are very low and 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 do that do you think that he will add more employees or do you think it will remain a pretty small biz it will remain a very small business okay i mean i i think that that's worth doing um and and um actually i wrote about this if you go on to my to the website to jillonmoney.com we have Mm -hmm. uh retirement plan what did we call that article mark it was called like retirement plans for small businesses or self-employed retirement plan, something like that. Hold on. He's going to look it up to see because God knows I can barely remember what happened three minutes ago, (laughs) let alone what I wrote three months ago. Um, But it it was, uh, well, you know, I'm just, let me describe what I'm looking. I'm through a glass. He's looking, he's looking. looks like he's chewing furiously on his muffin. I don't know what else is happening right now. (laughs) Okay. Retirement plans for self-employed. What was the date, Mark? September of 2019. So that's what you're going to okay. check, okay? And right. I have an explanation of all of them, and you can check it out. How's that? Perfect. All right. That solves that. Go yes. go forth. Uh, let me know if you have any trouble with the rollover. And uh, and okay. like I said, if you did have, if you did run into a brick wall on that, at the very mm-hmm. least, you could start converting a small amount every year from that mm-hmm. retirement account. Again, you would have to burn up some of the cash in your emergency yeah. fund. You got to have money to do it. But, yeah. you know, as long as you're converting that money and you're still in the 24% tax bracket on the conversion, then mm-hmm. I you get to the same place. You really do. And you're just making sure that that money is already um, had the tax extracted from it, and then the money will grow without any tax going forward. So again, that's a great plan B option. Okay. Okay. Great. Let Perfect. me know. Thank you so much. All Jill. right, Lily. Take care. Thanks so much for calling. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another happy person there. Come on, Mark. All right. Um, okay. Here we go. Quick question from somebody named Peggy. Had to go down and read that. Okay, Peggy says, I'm about to buy a car and I'm looking to retire in the next six months. I want to travel, but I need a larger vehicle to feel comfortable. No debt, nothing. Got about $850,000 available, not including a home that is paid off. Should I go new? Want that smell? (laughs) Or settle for an SUV a few years old? Do I deserve new? I've worked hard. I've saved hard. I'm 64 years old. I'm done with the grind. I'm up for working part-time in the next few years. Help Jill set me straight quickly. Many thanks. And I love this little thing. It says, sent with peace and goodwill. I should put that on the my, but never would know I'm full of crap. Uh, okay. Um, so, all right. I am of mixed emotions on this. If you, I don't love the idea of you burning up cash, 
of 850 grand. So I don't know exactly what's going on for you. I know that, you know, you're retired, but do you need to live off of that $850,000? Or maybe if you've got a pension and Social Security and that totally covers your needs, then that would be fine. I'm cool with that. But, and this is the big but, if you're saying, asking me whether you can take 50 grand out of your 850 by a brand new car and then you're living on that 800 that's left I'm less excited about it so I need a little bit more information um, I'm not a car person I was just with two friends of mine and they were started talking about cars and I I leaned back and sipped my tequila and my friend Michael said to me are you just totally tuning out of this conversation I said yes I totally am tuning out I could care less about cars so that's me I've always bought lightly used cars for cash and I drive them into the ground Um, but I get that you want a new car I I don't know about deserving Uh, a lot of people deserve lots of things aren't you so lucky that you actually uh, are retired and maybe that's the thing to focus on and uh, again, if you send me a few more details, I think I'd be um, more helpful to you. But let me know a little bit more about what's going on. Fair enough? Mark, I think that's fair. Mark's not a car person either, but you bought a new car. Uh, he re- Reluctantly. But there was a good deal. And we had our friend from Consumer Reports, Mike, give us all of the the skinny. And basically, Mark just bought exactly what he said. I'm going to do the same thing when I, my car dies. Hopefully that's not for a while. All right, it's Jill on Money. And if you are interested, we've got all sorts of great resources on the website. And you can also buy my book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money, 13 Ways to Right Your Financial Wrongs. It's Jill on Money. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And you know what? It's the beginning of the year. And what I love to say about the beginning of the year is that it's the perfect time to focus on your financial life. Why? Well, you know, you get all those year-end statements or quarter-end statements. But also, I know that you're excited for this. You're preparing for tax season. So essentially, I would say the very best time to start focusing on your money has to be the months of basically January through April. And so let's take advantage of that. You know, in a lot of parts of the country, it's pretty cold, it's nasty. What better time to snuggle up to some statements and try to figure out what's going on? If you need some help, just send us an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. That is what Kevin did. And he writes that he and his wife are both retired. And they've got U.S. postal pensions and full Social Security. So he goes on to say, we also have thrift savings accounts that we have not needed to touch. How great is that? They're both in the G fund. The G fund is the government securities fund. So that's pretty safe stuff. Okay. Kevin goes on. He says, we've got um, individual medical plans as well as vision and dental coming out of our income. My wife turned 65 in February. She will begin to get Medicare. I still have two years to go. Her Medicare will amount to additional deductions from her income. Okay. The supplemental plan that we have reimburses them 800 bucks a year. They've got six years left on the mortgage, which costs $1,000 a month. Question, what to do with our thrift savings plan? I would like something that is protected from the IRS, but generates interest and pays a monthly stipend. Does that exist? What are your thoughts? Okay, let's let's calm down a second here. Because Kevin, you have monthly income. It's called a pension. And you have monthly income from Social Security. So what is it that you're seeking them from that thrift savings plan? Why do you need to generate monthly a monthly stipend even if you needed to take money out i mean you don't mention the amounts but you said that the thrift savings account you did not think you were needing to touch it i wouldn't do anything with this thrift savings account i would keep it in the g fund i might add a little c fund i might add a little bit of stocks just to protect yourself against future inflation but don't do anything keep it where it is don't don't let some insurance salesperson try to sell you 
into an annuity. Don't roll it over. Keep it where it is. The thrift savings plan is a great retirement account. And, and, and I don't, I'm not sure that you need anything more. Uh, let's see. Lawrence is 66 and he receives social security. And he says, how do I start withholding for federal tax purposes? You mean from social security or from something else? I'm not sure. Um, usually you can just have social security administration re- withhold a certain amount. If you've got other income, you may have to do quarterly estimates, but that's really something that we need to get into to figure out like anything else going on in your financial life. So follow up with me. Okay. Jim writes, I've been thinking about what will happen to my 401k when the market makes a huge correction sometime in the future. I've been thinking about that too, Jim. It's never fun. So Jim is right now uh, in large U.S. equity, State Street S&P 500 index fund. And it's amazing. He's got $260,000 in the fund. And I'm not sure he's got anything else. So that's it. So he says, I'm concerned what would happen if uh, the market were to tank. And he says, we have funds to invest in here at work. I don't have those accounts offhand. I think there's 20 or so funds from which to choose. Okay, so Jim, here's what you're going to do. You've got money in this S&P 500 fund, and you're not going to get 100% out of it. But what you probably need to do is to diversify a little bit. You don't mention your age. You don't mention what other things are going on in your financial life. But what I will encourage you to do is to get that list, that list of 20 funds, and shoot us a copy. We're probably going to choose a bond index fund to round you out. But essentially, without having any type of information about you, what I need to now know is when you think you're going to need the money, are you entitled to a pension? What else is going on in your financial life? More information. That's going to be the theme of this program today. Uh, but, you know, we want to help you out. So we need that's a problem. We need the information. Frank wants to know, What's the chance of everybody paying Social Security taxes on 100% of their income? Mm, Low, very low. So what I would think is uh, the Social Security wage base, that's the amount of money that that applies, the Social Security tax applies to, uh, that would is probably going to increase. It doesn't mean it's going to increase to infinity. It means it's going to increase. So um, right now, um, for 2020, the Social Security wage base is $137,700. Eh, could it go up to 150? Sure. Could it go up to 200? Sure. I don't think it's going to go up much beyond that. That's just you know, and that's a total guess. But I, I think there's going to be some combination of the Social Security wage base going up, maybe an increase in Social Security tax rates. And maybe a little bit of a push up in the age, which is the, you know, the essential like full retirement age or FRA. Some combination of those three things would certainly shore up the social security system. But I think it's essentially a 0% chance that the government taxes all of your money with social security taxes. I just don't think that's going to happen. And you don't, it doesn't have to happen. Just a little bit, a few of those little um, nips and tucks will do the job. You're listening to Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Maybe you're poking around the website at jillonmoney.com. All you have to do is click on the contact button on the upper right-hand corner. And you know what? Send us a lot of information. If you think you're going to ask about asset allocation, maybe you just want to send along a little copy of your choices. Do that. So easy. You can always send us an email, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. You're back. It's the Jill on Money Show. We are broadcasting live from the Capital One Studios. Capital One, what's in your wallet? All right, before we finish up the hour, let's try to squeeze in a couple more of uh, your emails. Mike writes that he's trying to figure out the best way to divide my account among the different investment options. He writes that he's 57 years old, possibly going to retire in four years. What are these people retiring for? They're too young. Mark, come on. Let's get this out. We got to stop doing this. Don't retire at 61. Anyway, he writes, 
I have $290,000 invested in my thrift savings plan. Hey, this is like the hour of thrift savings plans. 201,000 of the 290 is in the G fund and 44,000 is in the C fund. 44,000 is in the S fund. Should I increase the C and S fund allocations? I don't know. I, it really depends. This is this is a tough one. So Mike, you've got, obviously you will be able to get a pension because you're part of the thrift savings plan. So you must be a worker in the government. Is that pension and future social security going to cover all of your needs? Do you have other money that's invested? Or is this money going to be really important and you need it to grow even more? So if you're at 70% in safe stuff, 30% in riskier stuff, you know, you could get away with leaving it alone. Uh, I would be worried about increasing it if you really didn't need to increase it. And I also be, I'd be remiss in saying to anyone out there listening that if in fact you really do believe that you're going to need some of this money and it's, it, you're going to need to live on the money, you can't afford to take a big risk. So when you're looking at your asset allocation, which I'm really glad everyone's doing, again, be beginning of year is a great time to do it. It's very important that you are running through your whole retirement plan scenario. That's going to guide your asset allocation. If you need help doing that, give us a holler. It's askjill at jillonmoney.com. And of course, there's tons of calculators out there, but you know we might be able to walk you through it pretty easily. When we return, we are going to get back to your questions and we will be delighted to help you out. If you're on the website, remember, just click the contact button. That's right there at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. the weekend and that can only mean one thing you're listening to jill on money the show that takes the mystery out of your finances here's your host jill schlesinger welcome back it's our number two of jill on money and we are broadcasting live from the policy genius studios policy genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance just go to policygenius.com Okay. Um, by the way, I was just running through some life insurance quotes with a friend of mine at work. She pulls me aside and she goes, oh, you know, I've got this whole life policy and the insurance guy wants me to buy more. And uh, I, I actually went on the Policy Genius website with her. We clicked away, click, 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 click. About 15 minutes later, it was all done. It was so easy. So um, I think that it's very important that you review when you are being pitched any insurance product you review hey how much money do i need to have an in insurance is this the right type of insurance and anyone who's listened to this show knows that nine times out of ten i am a fan of term insurance okay now special treat i don't want to give too much away but this is a great story our guest this hour is frank abignale he is the guy behind catch me if you can remember that movie uh, he's written a new book called Scam Me If You Can. He is the AARP Fraud Watch Network Ambassador. He's got a fantastic story, so I don't want to give the, you know, do the whole story without him. So here is the first part of our interview with Frank Abagnale. Can you tell us a little bit about the Catch Me If You Can? Was that movie really true to life? I thought he did an excellent job of telling the story. For Steven Spielberg, it was the first time he made a movie about a real person, so he was extremely careful because I was living. Uh, so he found the three FBI agents that were retired, and he brought them to the set. The Bureau sent our information officer to the set to make sure he was accurate about what he said in reference to the FBI. I thought he stayed very close to the story. He changed minor things. You know, I have two brothers and a sister who said it was an only child. Things like that that he changed. That's around a, a weird bit. thing to change, though. Yeah, I think I he wonder didn't. Why. I think he didn't want to bring all because it's an unusual name. He didn't want to bring all the Abignales into uh, it. Ah, yeah. all right. Now, can you explain why on earth you decided to pretend you were a pilot when you were 16 years old? 
Um, back in the 1960s, my parents, after 22 years of marriage, one day decided to get a divorce. Uh, I was pulled out of a classroom in school, and uh, next thing I knew, I was standing in front of a judge. And I remember that the judge never looked at me, never acknowledged I was staying there, but he told me my parents were getting a divorce and I had to choose which parent I wanted to live with. What? And, Wait uh, a minute. Wait a minute. Is this because your mother left your father and then that's why you got to choose? Well, because I was 16, according to him, because I was 16 years old, I needed to make a choice which parent I was going to live with. Oh, my God. And being 16, I really couldn't make the choice. I loved both my parents, so I basically ran out the door, and the judge called for a recess. Uh, my mother never saw me again for seven years. My father never saw me. In the movie, that was the only thing. He had me going back to talk to my dad, but in real life, my dad never saw me again. He died while I was in the French prisons. Oh, um, my God. So yeah, Tragic. I ended up on the streets of New York City. A lot of kids ran away in the 1960s, but they got into Haight-Ashbury, the hippie scene, the drug scene. And I thought right away that, you know, I'm going to have to get creative because I'm 16 years old. So uh, back then we had a driver's license in New York. It didn't have a photo on it. It was an IBM card. So I altered just one digit of my date of birth. I was actually born in April of 1948, but I dropped the four and made it a three. That made me 26 years old. I always looked a little older. I always had a little bit of gray hair. Kids in school used to say that once a week I went to a private Catholic school that we had to go to mass. We had to dress in a suit. They said, you look like a teacher. You don't look like a student. So uh, I started lying about my age. And then I had a checking account. And I had a little money because I worked for my dad. He had a store downtown in Manhattan. And I went up from high school in the summer I'd worked. I had a little money saved up. And I started just writing a check to supplement my income, $20, $15. But I found it so easy to do. I would walk in the bank. I didn't have an account there. But people would say, yeah, I'll cash it for you. And uh, and then, of course, when I ran out of money, I kept writing those checks. And everything I did in my career as a teenager, because I was an adolescent, I had no fear of being caught mm-hmm. and no fear of consequences. And nothing was premeditated. So I saw a pilot come out of a hotel with an airline crew, and I thought to myself, boy, if I could get one of these uniforms, then when I walk in these banks, I could say that I'm an out-of-town pilot. It would be so much easier to cash a much bigger check. And so I finagled the uniform, and I got it was so it was like night and day. I walk in the bank, they say no problem at all. They cash the check, and I realized the power of that uniform. That they only really saw the uniform, not me, not the check. And then you know, just as it showed in the movie, I go out to the airport, and I'm going to buy a ticket. And it was the TWA terminal. It was a TWA ticket counter, like they did in the movie. And she said to me, "Are you riding or are you flying?" So I beg your pardon. Are you riding the jump seat? Or you're going to purchase a ticket. I said, well, I, I could ride the jump seat. She said, okay, well, that's fine. Then I realized I could fly around the world for, for free. free. <laughs> that's said, awesome. So everything just came to me as I was doing these things. But you never, you make this point, you never actually flew a plane. No. And I never flew on Pan Am. And people said, why didn't you? And the reason was that I didn't want somebody to say to me, you know, I'm based in San Francisco. I never met you. I've been out there 15 years. Or, you know, uh. your ID card's not just like my ID card. So I always wrote on every other airline, knowing they could never ask me to do anything. I just sit in the jump seat and ride. That's amazing. Okay. So from 16 to how old? To 21 as a pilot? Uh, No. So let's let's do 16. You start doing the pilot. About 18, then I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, hung up the uniform, had a lot of money, moved into a singles complex. And on the application, again, nothing premeditated, but it asked occupation. Well, I didn't want to write airline pilot because they were looking for me. So I wrote doctor. And nothing else. But the apartment manager said, oh, you're a doctor. Uh, Yes, Mm. ma'am. Well, what type of doctor are you? And I said, I'm a medical doctor, but I'm not practicing medicine. I came to Atlanta to invest in some real estate. Oh, how interesting. Well, what type of medical doctor? And this was a singles complex. Only single people live there. So I said it was a pediatrician. And I moved in. And the next thing I know, the guy moves in next to me as a pediatrician. So I start realizing I have to kind of learn a little bit of how to have a conversation with him. But then he invited me up to the hospital to meet everybody. And then so one day, sure enough, they come and say, well, one of the doctors had a death in his family. Do you mind covering a shift in administrative capacity, not treating anybody? And I thought, well, I could give that how a shot. Bad, how, bad, <laughs> how hard could that be? Yeah, you I know, could, right? I'll well, give it a shot. Yeah. So I, 
I impersonated a doctor. Uh, you know, I met a girl who was a flight attendant. In the movie, it's a little different, but in real life, she was a flight attendant. Her dad was the attorney general in Louisiana. Oh, my God. Uh, That's flirting with some danger right there, right? right? But, uh, you know, again, back in those days, a lot of pilots were always furloughed. So I told her I was an airline pilot. I'd been furloughed. She said, well, what's your degree? And I said, I have a law degree, but I haven't been practicing. So she introduced me to her dad. I took the bar in Louisiana. I was able to pass the bar. You took the bar? Yes. I didn't know that. Yes. Wow. And actually, in Louisiana, at the time I took the bar, there was no requirement for a law degree. Anyone could take the bar. And, of course, I had somewhat of a photographic memory, so I was able to memorize what I needed to know. Uh, and I took the two-month prep course that all law students take to prepare them for the bar in that particular state. Passed the bar. I went to work for then Attorney General P.F. Grimion in the <laughs> Civil Division of the That's State amazing. Court. I spent about a year there. I was always smart enough to know you can get away with it for a while. You can't get away with it forever. Right. So I always was smart enough to, to move on. Okay, we'll get back to Frank Abagnale in just a second. If you've got a financial question, just send us an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Four hundred one ks, IRAs, refinancing. She covers it all. Back to Jill on money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on money, and we are in the middle of a great interview with Frank Abagnale. Remember Frank Abagnale? He was the guy who was portrayed in the movie Catch Me If You Can. If you haven't seen that movie in a while, it's so worth going back and checking it out. Frank's story is kind of amazing and that's why we're going to spend more time talking about it than maybe in previous interviews the reason of course is that his story informs where he is today and obviously everyone's story informs where you are today but you know if you're a scam artist what better way to essentially make make uh, amends for what you've done besides number one serving in jail and number two, helping other people avoid scams. And that's what he does right now. He's written a book called Scam Me If You Can. And here's more of our interview with Frank Abagnale. How did you make the jump into forging and really creating faux currency? To- yeah, that was the, the thing. You know, I started out just writing checks. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I did that, uh, again, never premeditated. So this is a perfect example. I went to a bank in Chicago, opened a checking account with $100, and I gave them phony identification. And I was thinking to myself, in two weeks, this bank will mail me 200 printed checks in a box with this name. And with this ID, I'll just go cash them. So the new accounts person says, here's some temporary checks. We'll be mailing you your printed checks in about 10 days. So being young, I was very inquisitive. So I said, I noticed you didn't give me any deposit slips. Oh, no, they come from the check printer. Be in the back of the checkbook. You get them in 10 days. Well, what if I want to make a deposit tomorrow? Well, you see that table in the lobby has all those forms on there. Help yourself to a blank deposit slip. Then write your account number and I gave you. Use those to get your printed ones. So I went over and I took a stack of them. I went back. I kept looking at them and I thought to myself, I wonder. So I went out and bought what was called a magnetic encoder. It was looked like a big calculating machine. And I magnetically encoded my account number on the bottom of all these blanks. Then I went back to the bank, put them on the shelf, and everyone who came in put their money directly in. Oh my, my God, that's awesome. <laughs> but I would do stuff that I didn't know would work. But, you know, I called the bank the next day. I said, I'm checking my balance 41000 oh, I'll be right down. <laughs> that's amazing. Okay. So now, how old are you when that started to happen? Uh, everything I did was between 16 and 21. Mm-hmm. I was arrested when I was 21 years old. Why did you get arrested? What what was, what happened that like caused you? Did you go one step too far? No, I actually, first of all, I always knew I'd get caught. I, it was just a matter of time. The law sometimes sleeps, but the law never dies. So it was just a matter of time. I was caught. Uh, I, I'd stopped doing all this, and I was living in a little town in southern France called Montpellier. And someone recognized me, a flight attendant, and she notified the authorities. 
Uh, they arrested me and charged me in France for forging checks, and they sent me to French prison. So How I, was that? Did they give you wine and cheese? No, in French it was prison? a horrible, horrible really? experience. I wrote about it in the book Catch Me If You Can, and uh, Steven Spielberg actually filmed in the cell I was in and, the th- and reconstructed it during the time mm. I was there. It was a horrible place. And when that sentence was over, I was extradited to Sweden where I was charged with forging checks in Sweden. They convicted me of forgery and they sent me to French prison, uh, excuse me, to Swedish prison in Malmo, Sweden. And when that prison term was up, the U.S. government took custody of me and returned me to the United States. How long did you serve? About a year in Europe altogether. Mm -hmm. And then the U.S. government brought me back and a U.S. federal judge in Atlanta, Georgia, sentenced me to 12 years in federal prison. So I served four of those 12 years. Which federal prison were Petersburg, you? Virginia. How did you survive? Like, uh, you when know, did you, were, you, like, were you a famous convict? No, back then nobody really knew what okay. I did. And um, I was just a check writer. You know, I said, well, you're in jail, wrote bad oh, checks. Oh, bad checks, you know, right. And um, I served four years of that sentence. And when I was 26, the government offered to take me out of prison if mm-hmm. I'd go to work with an agency of the federal government. They didn't say what agency. For the remainder of my sentence, or until my parole had been completed. So, of course, being the opportunist I was, I said, absolutely. Yes, that sounds like a much better deal. deal. So I was released. Uh, I've been at the FBI now 43 years. I have uh, have educated two generations of FBI agents. How did you meet your wife? I met my wife on an undercover assignment because when I first came out, I worked undercover. And I met my wife in Houston, Texas, on an undercover assignment. She wasn't part of the investigation, but she worked where I was investigating. And when it was over, I had to tell her the truth and tell her who I really was and my real name and uh, my background. And um, my wife actually eventually married me against the wishes of her parents. But I've been a convict. I know, but I've been married for 43 years. So it's been let me let me ask you another question. So, what was it like reuniting with your mother? I mean, you hadn't seen her for seven years. How did that happen? Uh, not until I really got out of prison. And um, you know, you as I, like always, you know, your your parents, your siblings, they're your family, and no matter what you do, they're always going to take you back and uh, support you. So, I mean, my mother, uh, I. I don't think when I was doing the things and they came to her, she believed that I could possibly be doing the things that they said I was doing. But I think in the end, if she was my mom and obviously... Yeah. Your siblings older or younger? Two older. My brother and sister are older than I, and then a younger brother, and only my sister's left. Uh, two brothers have passed away. Wow. This is quite a life already. Yeah. Okay. So what is it about this field that I mean, because there are some people who might say this was a great opportunity for the FBI, but I never want to touch anything in law enforcement ever again. Why were you drawn to teaching this two generations of FBI officials about what you knew? What was important to you about that? Yeah, and that's a good question because, you know, uh, people like me to say that you were born again, uh, you saw the light in prison, prison rehabilitated you. I said, no, I was the same person when I came out of prison. I was the person going into prison. Mm-hmm. I was that opportunist who just saw that as an opportunity. So I said, okay, I'll do it. I didn't know that I would go straight. But uh, two things happened. Obviously, uh, one, I met my wife and uh, fell in love, and that, that changed. She believed in me, had faith in me. That really turned my life around. And bringing children into the world and responsibility of being a father turned my life around. But back, you have to remember, back at that time when I went to the FBI, was shortly after J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, all the agents were white. They were all men. Uh, they were pretty much Harvard, Yale graduates, law degrees, accounting degrees. Um, so there's a great scene in the movie which Steven Spielberg replicated in real life happened. That was the Washington field office, not headquarters, where I walked in and all the agents stood up like in a protest that I was there. Um But you surround yourself by incredible people who had such an incredible ethical background, their character, their love of family, their uh, love of country, that it starts to rub off on you and you start to realize these are amazing people doing amazing things and that I'm part of that. And it took years to build credibility to where those agents came to where they trusted me. I know that people are fascinated by my life between the ages of 16 and 21, but to be honest with you, I'm 71, and I wake up every morning and say to myself, I cannot believe that I did all these things, Uh, came out of prison, have worked for my government for 43 years, have 
worked with 50% of the Fortune 500 companies to help them with issues they've had. Um, brought three wonderful sons into the world who one is an FBI agent celebrating oh. 14 years in the Bureau. Wow. Uh, and married to my one and only wife for 43 years. So I recognize that I live in an amazing country where you can make mistakes. You go pay your debt and you can come out. And if you really want to, if you want to change your life, you can change your life. But you have to want to do that. Was there any guilt that you felt in the aftermath, in the middle of it, it's hard to feel guilty, right? Okay, but, it, so how does that come out? It for comes you? up. It came with maturity, and I truly believe yes. Your parents instill certain things in you if you're lucky, and um, you know the the belief in God, the belief in right and wrong, and same way in Catholic school. And yes, we all go down the road sometimes, and we make the wrong turn, and we get off on the wrong road. But that rope they gave us is always there, so you can reach out, grab that rope and pull yourself back. Unfortunately, a lot of children today don't have that rope. So once they make that turn, Mm. they have no way to ever get back to the right, the right path because the right path has never been given to them. Okay. We'll get back to more with Frank. I'm not letting him go this quickly. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. If you're on the website, if you're on jillonmoney.com, just click the upper right hand corner and send us a note. Could be anything that's going on early in the year. Tax season's coming up. Let's get these issues fleshed out now, right now. Do it. Okay, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. So easy. Send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Send us a note from the website. It's all there. You know, when I was uh, writing my book, when we were talking about different chapters, I remember that it was a bit of a struggle. I had to talk to both my agent and the publisher about getting a chapter on your protecting your identity in my book. And I felt really strongly about this because it's like one of those things like, oh, eat your vegetables. No kidding. Right. But the reason is that we had seen so many data breaches and we've also been hearing more and more about how people fall prey to phishing scams. You know, there's the old scam for the like, I'm calling from the IRS or they send you a note and all these things are happening. And I think that in many respects, the idea of scamming, which is as old as the day is long, has a a new flavor to it in this day and age. And maybe that's a little bit because, you know, it's sort of easy to do. It's hard to scam somebody face to face, right? You have to be a special kind of person to really pull that off. Sure, there are the Bernie Madoffs, but what's more likely is that, you know, someone does something nefarious online and then unsuspecting people fall prey to it. That's what I, that's what I think. Anyway, We're going to get back to our interview with Frank Abagnale. Remember, he was the guy whose life was used as the basis of the movie Catch Me If You Can. He wrote the book Catch Me If You Can. So uh, he's here to talk about how today's technology is rife with problems. Here's more of our interview with Frank Abagnale. What is it about today's technology that makes it better or worse for us as consumers? Well, two things. First of all, it's 4,000 times easier to do today than what I did back uh, 50 years ago because I didn't have the technology that exists today. But what's real scary today is, you know, 50 years ago, there were con men and con women, which stood for confidence people. They were people that gained your confidence. But of course, they had to be in front of you. You had to see them. So they were well-dressed. They were well-spoken. They had a great vocabulary. They were very likable and they won you over. But because they were a human being dealing with another human being, there was always a little bit of compassion. There was always a little bit of emotion involved. So you get the con man that says, you know, I'm not going to rip this old man off for everything he has. I don't want to take his home and take his life savings, but I'm going to take some of his money. Today, you're dealing with someone sitting in a kitchen in their pajamas on a laptop with a cup of coffee in Moscow. They never see you. You never see them. So there is zero compassion. They will take you for every penny you have, and they don't care who you are or what the circumstances are. And I think that's what's real scary. The whole emotional side of it, the compassion side of it, is gone. 
You write in the book, experts say the effects of fraud on, on individuals are similar to the psychological aftermath experienced by victims of violent crimes and war, ranging from anxiety to emotional volatility, depression to post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, I was surprised to read that because I thought, well, everybody's getting scammed right now. Everybody's got their their stuff's getting stolen. Or does it have to be a more personal, direct event? There's a couple of things here. First of all, um, unfortunately, when people are scammed, they don't want to tell anybody because, first of all, if it's a senior, an elderly person, they're afraid then the daughter says, see, mom, you can't handle your money. Mm. I need to take over your bank account, handle all your finances, and leaves their independence. They're afraid that if they tell the police, the neighbors are going to file, say, well, Mrs. Jones, the idiot, she fell for the sweepstakes scam, lost $5,000. So they don't tell anybody. So these criminals just keep going on to get other people. So that's real bad. And I always tell them you need to tell somebody, otherwise they're going to go steal from somebody else. It's a lot like when somebody says, yeah, robbers came in my house. They didn't take anything, but they went through all my drawers and all my personal things, and you feel very violated. Mm. But I think the biggest key for me was that, you know, when I was doing the things I was doing, my victims were banks, corporations, hotels, never an individual. So people that I would meet, like a flight attendant I might date or someone I met, I gave them things. I took them on trips, took them out to dinner, whether they were a guy or a girl and they were friends. In the end, when it was found out who I was, all these people were very, very mad. And being young, I said to myself, why are these people mad at me? I I didn't do anything to them. If anything, I gave them things. I took them on trips. But they felt deceived. They felt that I believed you were who you say you were. I I thought you were my friend. And all the time you were deceiving me. You didn't trust me to tell me who you were. People are very affected by those Mm. things. Who is more likely to be scammed? You mentioned that older people, and I know that they're often when we get the the dirty dozen list from about the top financial scams or the top scams, often they're directed at older people. But you say anyone can be scammed. Anyone can be scammed. But what's interesting is when doing the research for this book over five years, uh, I found that millennials are actually more scammed more often than seniors, but seniors lose more money because well, they, they have, have more, more money, money. Right? Yeah, exactly. So why do you think that is? Uh, because young people just think everything's okay. They give away inf- all kinds of information about themselves. They fall for a lot of the scams where they're on their computer and it pops up, Microsoft, you have malware on your computer, call us 800 number. They fall for that all the time, where seniors are less likely to fall for that particular scam. But yes, anyone can be scammed. I do a podcast for ARP every Wednesday out of Washington, D.C. called The Perfect Scam. So people call in. We send an investigator out to interview them. We've had two former FBI directors, long retired now, have been scammed. But they were good enough to call in and say, this is what happened to me. Uh, The editor-in-chief of Time magazine, 35 years at Time, he had been scammed. But he was good enough to call in and say, this is what happened. Anyone, including myself can be scammed. So there's nothing to be ashamed of if somebody scams you, but you need to tell somebody so they don't go do it to somebody else. And there's something slightly different about a scam, which is, you know, obviously an illegal endeavor, and someone who just like pitches and sells you something that's nonsense, right? Right. Okay. So how do you tell the difference between sort of an aggressive sale and a scam? Or it doesn't matter? Well, there's still a scam. So today in the front page of the Wall Street Journal... They're talking about now all of these student loans and these companies that have popped up telling you, I can fix your student loan, $1,200, $40 a month, I'll take care of it. They they can't do that, but you could do the things they're telling you they do your own, just like these fix your credit. You can do that yourself. You don't need to pay somebody to do that for you. So those, in my my mind, are just scams. They're just another form of, uh, of scams. There are so many, almost if you look at almost every ad on television, it's somewhat of a scam. It so, doesn't do what they say it does, et cetera. Okay, one more segment with Frank. I can't, I can't help it. He's so great. He's so entertaining. So during the break, hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com, and there you can listen to past shows, or maybe if it's later in the week, you might want to find this show. So check it out, jillonmoney.com. You can just go to the Listen tab, and we'll be there. Be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. 
You're back. It's Jill on Money. And we're going to get into the last segment with Frank Abagnale, former scam artist, but now super good guy. He's written a book called Scam Me If You Can, right? You get the little play on it because it was Catch Me If You Can. He was a scam artist, you know? He played all these different parts in life and was able to really find ways to hoodwink a number of people. Well, he's grown up many decades later. He's now the uh, Fraud Watch Network Ambassador for AARP. And in this final segment of our interview... Frank explains why every scam is usually rooted in something emotional, right? Think about it. Even with financial stuff, there is fear and greed. Usually a scam artist, a financial scam artist, is somebody who is going to prey on either fear or greed. Okay, here's the last part of our interview with Frank Abagnale. So I'm wondering in your now, you know, four plus decades of doing this, how you see the emotional part of this. People who are fearful or greedy seem to me to be the best targets. Is there anyone else who becomes a target in this? Yeah, there's always, there's a lot of greed in it. Mm. I get a big kick out of the ones that I get. There's so many of them. Well, you, they get a call and say you want a sweepstakes that come out of Jamaica most of the time. So I say to the woman or the man, uh, did you enter a sweepstakes in Jamaica? Uh, No. But then how could you have won the sweepstakes? (laughs) And why would you pay them money up front for money they're going to send send you. So I think a lot of it is education is an extremely important tool to fighting crime. So whether I'm training FBI agents or whether I'm training consumers or bankers, if I say to them, here's the scam, this is how it works, this is what they say, this is what they do, uh, then you're not going to get scammed. But people are basically honest. And because they're honest, they don't have a deceptive mind. So if the phone rings and it says NYPD, they believe it's NYPD. And if they get on the phone and say, we arrested your grandson on the West Side Highway. He was drunk while driving. He had his girlfriend with him. They tell you the girlfriend's name. He was driving this kind of vehicle. Uh, he'd asked us not to call his parents. They tell you the parent's name. He asked us to call you. He needs to post bail within two hours. He'll have to uh, spend the weekend in jail. Well, how would I post his bail? I Just give me a credit card oh, number and we can post his that's bail. That's brilliant. But what they're doing is they go to social media where the grandson said, here's a picture of my car. Here's my girlfriend and me. Here's her name. Here's my parents' name. So they get so much pertinent information that it sounds so real that the person thinks, well, caller ID is very easily manipulated. You can make it say whatever you want it to say when the phone rings. People don't know that until you tell them that. So I hope that this book gives you the tools to recognize those things, but also as a reference that if later on something comes up, you go, I think this might be a scam. You can go look it up and say, it is a scam. This is how it works. Can you talk a little bit about the efficacy of changing passwords and these long 42-letter symbol passwords? Are they worth it or not? Absolutely. So I wrote back in the 1990s a book called The Art of the Steel, and in that book I said that passwords were for tree houses. And I wrote saying that passwords were invented in 1964. So I was 16 years old. I didn't even start doing these things. And now I'm 71, and here we are using passwords, still using passwords. And when we look at all the ransomware and all the breaches that occur and all the malware, it all comes down to passwords. So we have to absolutely eliminate the use of passwords. So I have spent the last uh, five years working with a company out in Arizona, a technology company, that I developed some other technology with years ago that they use in banks now to detect fraud. I work with this company now to eliminate the need of passwords. And we've developed that technology to do just that. Now you see, you might have seen an ad recently where Serena Williams is running through the park and she's in her jogging outfit. She only has her cell phone. She sees a necklace in the market she likes. So she walks over to her ATM. She presses the app on her phone. She gets some money, no card, no password. So many banks are converting now away from passwords, our airlines and retailers. So I think it's now in the next two or three years, we'll see passwords leave. You will be identified by your phone. I'm not real thrilled about that, Mm. but that's a device we're all going to have on us, and that's the device that will identify us. But what I do like is that when you call the call center now, instead of that call center, say, at your bank, on that screen of that call center person is all your pertinent information. So they're asking you, what's your social security number? What's your mother's maiden name? Uh, They won't have any of that. So that's just people who can give that to somebody else. Mm. You eliminate that. Mm. They will just say, Mr. Abingdale, will you press the bank's app on your phone? 
okay, how can I help you? And so, they'll have identified and so the me. Da- and the only downside is you lose your phone, but then you can report it's stolen. And right, then and everything- not only that, if you lose your phone, I'd still need to have your picture, your biometrics, or your fingerprint, or your password to get into your phone in order to access it. How about the airport stuff like Clear or Global Entry where they look? They seem to be looking at your fingerprints? Well, here's the problem. We just had a breach about two weeks ago of a company that keeps 20 million fingerprints and biometric pictures for City of New York, Australia, the UK, governments, private companies. So you access a building. Those are the companies that keep the data. Come on. They will breach. So now 20 million fingerprints and a photo biometrics are in the hands of somebody else. People went for this face app who said, hey, uh, here's a, I like to see, here's me, I'm 20. How would I look if I was 60? 80 million Americans signed up for this Russian app, which if you read the terms in their contract, irrevocable, they can do anything they want with it. The Russians now have the biometrics and the information on 80 million Americans. So those are tools that can be used against us years later. So we do such ridiculous things without ever thinking them through. Thanks so much to Frank Abagnale. We will put a link up to his book, Scam Me If You Can. And by the way, uh, you know, AARP does have a fraud network uh, line that you can check out also. All right. Next up, we're going to close out the show. A quick question from one of you all. If you've got a financial question, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Before we finish up the program, want to squeeze in a couple more emails if possible. Remember, the Jill on Money Show, we are dedicated to trying to solve your financial problems. And we are broadcasting live from the Policy Genius Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. Just go to policygenius.com and check it out. Okay, James writes that he is in need of a second set of eyes to manage his retirement assets. He says, I've been with Fidelity since my work days. I'm 68 years old, but I feel that staying in an active position in relation to investments is prudent. Seeing that you aren't located where I am, Louisville or Kentucky for that matter, can you recommend a planner or advisor? First of all, I don't act as an investment advisor anymore. Those days are long gone. But you know what, James? I think that uh, it could be interesting to find out what exactly you're seeking. If you just want a money manager, there are a lot of really good options. Some of the online platforms like Betterment or Wealthfront, Vanguard Personal Service Advisor, Schwab Intelligent Portfolio, uh, even Fidelity might have some. There are also organizations that will kind of vet advisors for you. That is like NAPFA, the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors. You can go to napfa.org. Or you can go to the Certified Financial Planner website, letsmakeaplan.org. But it really does depend on what you need. If you're just looking for money management, you can get that really cheap. If you want full-blown financial planning, it could cost more. So again, investments, cheap. Go robo-advisor, no sweat. Advice, more expensive. You may need to, you may even have to pay a little bit more for advice through some of those organizations, or alternatively, you might have to pay up for somebody who's going to customize that advice with a full-blown financial plan, someone who's a fiduciary. If you go to the resource tab at jillonmoney.com, you will find that we have questions that you should ask before you hire any of those kinds of individuals. Okay, that's it. That's the program. Thank you so much for listening. If you have questions during the week, just send us an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. And don't forget, if you're on jillonmoney.com, that's our website. You can sign up for our free weekly newsletter and also buy my book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money, 13 Ways to Right Your Financial Wrongs. We'll see you next week.